gospel lesson for this Sunday is found in the book of John, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to them, those again who are listening to his message, and the, the 5,000 who come to feast from the miracle, I am the bread of life, Jesus said. The one who comes to me will not be hungry, and the one who believes in me will never be thirsty. So when the Jews were complaining about him because he said, I am the bread of life, come come down from heaven. And they were saying, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I've come from heaven? So Jesus answered and said to them, Stop complaining amongst yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. For it is written by the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. But I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate man in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes from heaven, so that anyone may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I will give for the life of the world also is my flesh. The gospel according to our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Heavenly Father, bless this word today that we might be filled with your presence. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a reminder that we are in this series over the course of the month of August, the Bread of Life statements every week. And so as a participant, as one who's been blessed by Jesus' Bread of Life, we know that this is an eternal blessing, not just a materialistic blessing, but it leads to us in blessing people materialistically through food so that they also might receive Jesus. Those who are hungry must have their materialistic needs taken care of. Doesn't mean you need your million dollar, a million dollars in the bank. It does mean that we do need our bellies filled so we're prepared to hear the message of Jesus. And so we're inviting you this month to bring canned goods with you to worship. And if you aren't worshiping with us physically, I invite you to send a donation to the church that will be used solely for food assistance to the poor. Send us a check. You can make it out to Holy Trinity. It's the only time I'm asking for money from you. I would not ask you to fund the budget of the church. That's for people who feel called to serve God here at Holy Trinity. But maybe God has placed it on your heart so you would like to feed the poor. You write a check, and it says at the bottom of the check, for food assistance for the poor. Food assistance, or however you want to say it, just in the memo. We will guarantee you that 100 cents on every single dollar will go to purchasing food for the poor. I promise you that, okay? We would like you to participate that in that in some way. Well, let's take a look at this lesson for today, a little bit about this continuation of the bread of life statements of Jesus Christ that we started last week. Remember, this lesson is a part of that feeding of the 5,000 because people had sought Jesus out. They wanted him to be their personal Santa Claus and feed them every single day materialistic, materialistically, materialistic food. So they didn't have to go up, I guess, and work. They could free themselves from the bondage of having to go and work every day or something like that. I'm not sure what. But Jesus tells them he's got a larger purpose in mind than filling their bellies with food. He wants to transform their lives for an eternity. See, Jesus got a bigger picture always in mind than our daily picture. We think, when oh, one bad thing goes bad, God must not love us. God has always a bigger picture in mind than that one day, right? So wine, 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 wine. I'm going to give you an abridged history of whining in the Bible, okay? This is just a continuation of it. These folks are just like the Jews of the early days when the Jews were in the wilderness after being delivered from, by, uh, through the hand of Moses uh, on that journey to the promised land. The Jews complained to Moses, wine, 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 you brought us out into the wilderness and we're going to die here. You're going to make us starve to death. There's no food. Wine, wine, wine. So they just got freed from slavery in Egypt and they're whining about food that they got to eat. So guess, guess what God does? God takes care of them. God provides manna. Well, after a short time of this, 
manna in the morning, manna in the noon, manna in the evening. You'd think that would be a spectacular thing that God provided. They started whining and complaining again. Oh, they grew tired of eating manna every single day. <sighs> so guess what God did? God provided them with quail. It's a bird. So they got manna, they got quail, they had, they had it made, man. God was providing for them. But then they started complaining. Oh, we don't have any, we're thirsty. God, you need to provide us with sufficient water. So God provides them with water. Well, then they're out in the wilderness and they start to complain. We're looking at all these other nations. They have a king, a powerful person who can rule them and lead them. We want a king like that. And the prophets say, oh, are you guys stupid or what? You have a king. I'm warning you. This is what God said. You want a king, but I'm warning you. I'll give you a king, but guess what? You are going to rue the day that you had a king because they will take everything from you. So they got a king, and guess what happened? The kings took everything from them. They became impoverished to serve the needs of this wealthy, fat kings. Starting with, by the way, David. David was a vicious, kind, unkind, and cruel person. He was the man of God, but he had a really nasty side to him too. And his son Solomon, even worse. And it just kept getting worse as the generations went on. These kings were cruel, vicious, unkind. Did not have God at their heart. So then these people started complaining, well, we didn't know that was gonna happen to us with a king. So they started complaining about the unjust, oppressive kings. So guess what God did for them? God overthrew the kings. Well, they didn't like that either, because guess what? Now they are subject to other kings from other countries. And so now they start complaining that God had abandoned him. You get this idea, no matter what God does for them, they're never satisfied. So God finally returns them to the promised land, and guess what they do? They still complain. Now here they are complaining about Jesus, the one whom God had sent to set them free. You're not what we were expecting, Jesus. Wine, wine, wine. It's us Christians, right? Let's take a look at what they're complaining about. Jesus used a phrase that we miss in English. What does he say? I am the bread of life. I am the bread that came down from heaven. I emphasize that phrase, I am. A Jew would hear it. You don't hear it. I don't hear it. Jesus uses the I am phrase many times in the Gospel of John. The name which God used to reveal himself to Moses. Moses, remember, burning bush, he said, Who is it? Who should I say sent you or sent me? God says, Tell them, I am sent you. Jesus coupled this phrase with the statement that his point of origin is from heaven, not from earth. And they're like, Dummy, Jesus, we know where you came from. We know your father, Joseph. We know your mother, Mary. They know that Jesus' family was of humble origin. Jesus is nothing to brag about. Why, why, why? If God were truly to visit us, God wouldn't waste his time with a poor peasant uh, like you. He'd choose somebody of better stature. Are you kidding me, Jesus? In other words, here's their complaint. Oh, Jesus, we're so grateful for the food, but come on, you're an idiot. Thanks for the food, Jesus, but your origin story doesn't impress us much. God needs to do something better for us than you. <laughs> whine, whine. Stop your whining, okay? Verse 43, look what verse 42. Jesus said to him, stop your complaining, complaining amongst yourself. Just stop! Jesus tells them to open themselves up to the scripture. God is going to direct you through the scripture to me. Not to me, but to Jesus, right? And Jesus in turn will be the one who will make God known to them. Stop your whining and complaining as, oh, I'm not sufficient, Jesus is saying. I am going to bring the Almighty God into your presence. 
He has a gift to offer them that is so much better than materialistic blessings. The love of God, eternal life. So those gifts of the Old Testament, the gifts of the materialistic blessing and their materialistic nature, they might sustain the body for a time, but gosh, Jesus is the gift who will transform a person's relationship with God for an eternity. Wait, but does Jesus come in yellow? It's a tour de France, kind of a tour de France joke, right? So we can know he's a winner. We got to stop putting God in a box. As though God has got to perform the way we want God to perform in order for God to operate. We need to stop putting God in our human boxes, made boxes, their belief of that time that God could not use a person like Jesus was a stumbling block that kept them from truly seeing what God was trying to do in their midst. God uses always the most humble of people and elements to communicate the most transcendent and impressive events and things in the world. Jesus uses bread and wine. Jesus himself God comes to us in humble form of a peasant. God came to the world through the humble form of the Jews, the least likely of nations, the Bible says. In the end, faith is not learning and about learning the right doctrines to make sure you got your act together. Because here's the truth, we're all going to be wrong in the end. I know there are so, people are so arrogant about their theology. I'm going to tell you what. My theology is like this big. I, I'm, I'm hopeful this much of my theology is correct. I really do. I think what is correct is that Jesus brings God, God's love to us. And salvation is the gift of God. That's probably about all I'm going to be right about. Everything else, I, I have this feeling God's going to say, Oh my gosh, you got that wrong there, buddy. You know, God is going to say that to everybody else who's so self-assured of themselves. that They think they've got 100% of their doctrine completely right. I think God is going to humble us. I'm just telling you. Because it's not about our doctrines or dogmas. We're going to be wrong. We might need to temper our opinions with a bit more humility, right? Faith ultimately is about just putting our trust in the right person. That's the only thing you better hope we get correct. Everything else, it doesn't matter. Jesus is the one who makes God known to us and will transform our lives and put us into right relationship with the Almighty God. That is the only message of the gospel that you need to know. It doesn't matter what anything else you believe about the Bible, about the end times, about homosexuality, about this or that. These things, none of them have anything to do with salvation. Okay. We have... We limited human beings have the privilege to commune with the Almighty God, and that's the only thing that Jesus wants us to know. It's the only thing that Jesus says that's a, that is of importance to us that we need to consume and partake of. God cares for you and me. Me of all people. It's amazing, right? God cares for you. That's what God wants you to feast upon. That's what Jesus is bringing into your life. Communion with the Almighty God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we get so baffled by our doctrines and dogmas and what we think people need to believe in order to have a relationship with God. It's not about what we believe. It's not about our doctrines or dogmas. We're going to be so wrong about so many things. The only thing that matters is that we feast upon Jesus. And then we're in the process of being saved because of the relationship we have with you through Jesus Christ. So God, let us feast upon Jesus in this lifetime that our lives might continue to be saved every single day. Amen.